Welcome to the webinar, Next Flays Floating Wind. I appreciate everyone joining us today. We have a fantastic panel lined up to give us all the inside track on the latest developments in floating wind power. This webinar has been created in conjunction with the Offshore and Floating Wind Europe 2019 conference, which is being held in London this November on the 11th and 12th. So today we've got a fantastic panel with Eric and Paul from Quest Floating Wind Energy and Henrik from Hexken. Paul will be kicking things off with a look at the global market outlook, helping us to identify the hottest markets, biggest players and the roadmap forward. Henrik will then take us through Hexken's floating design, exploring technical challenges that we're all racing to solve as we move closer to commercial scale. And then Eric will follow on with the um, Quest's QVision platform to show us some real-time data. So we will then be uh, taking a short, well, a, a good-sized question and answer session. Um, we're going to leave plenty of time for that, so please do send your questions in throughout all the presentations. We'll get to them at the end, and we will try and answer as many as possible. Um, so, yeah, great. Send them in. So, Paul, I'd like to uh, invite you to share your screen now, if you can, and kick off the presentations. Very good. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, we appreciate you, uh, you and New Energy Update organizing uh, this fantastic webinar. Uh, we we're very pleased to participate. Just for confirmation, do you see my uh, presentation? Yep, we're all good. Thank you. Well, um, let's get started. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, depending on where you are. Uh, we're happy to be here today. Uh, my name is Paul Hillegeist. Uh, just a bit about us. Um, we have expert knowledge of the energy value chain from 20 years of experience in uh, as Quest Offshore, uh, where we engage clients with our strategic insight. Um, we actively develop strategic relationships with management teams of prospective clients, current clients, of course, operator developers, uh, leading designers, tier one and tier two supply chain, et cetera, and across the global financial sector. We are focused on the full uh, market for offshore wind, and we provide various products and subscription services as well as a full consultancy. Um, we have evolved, really uh, focused on offshore wind, evolving from Quest DNA, which was 20 years of experience in predictive analytics and technical um, market expertise, uh, where we focused on energy, specifically upstream oil and gas. Now we're dedicated to renewables. And the honeycomb shown here, it really are core capabilities. So on to the presentation. Uh, we'll provide a macro overview and we'll get into the offshore wind market uh, with uh, a comprehensive uh, overview of fixed and floating and then take a deep dive into floating wind and finally we'll end up with uh, our lcoe modeling exercise it's exciting to see the renewable energy is the fastest growing energy source accounting for 40 percent of the increase in primary energy usage leading to a highly diversified energy mix beyond 2040. New investment in renewable energy over the next decade is a multi-trillion dollar enterprise intent to deliver a growing share of total electricity demand generation. Renewables led by wind, offshore wind, and solar are growing exponentially and delivering bigger capacities at reduced cost. The global energy transition to a lower, lower carbon footprint presents many opportunities across industries to tackle new challenges through innovation and applied technology. Growth in the offshore wind market is projected to outpace onshore wind by more than twofold, and it's highly favorable for our industry that costs for offshore wind have plummeted more than 50% since 2012. In September, Quest debuted its Quest Offshore Wind Index, which illustrates a burgeoning offshore wind market, totaling 11,087 wind turbines, representing 96.8 gigawatts. The index comprises the competitive landscape of global fixed and floating offshore wind projects in various stages 
including under development, planned, and possible. Our index shows $248 billion in CapEx for a universe of 145 fixed projects and $47.6 billion in CapEx for 52 floating projects, representing a total turbine count of 9,5117 and 1,570 turbines, respectively. The uniqueness of CODI, Quest Offshore Wind Turbine Index, illustrates vital industry met metrics on offshore wind economics for developers in the supply chain, including LCOE and CapEx per megawatt. The index also includes a monthly tabulation of leading industry indicators as weighted averages, shown here highlighted in orange, such as rotor diameter, which has leaped 172.4 meters, megawatts per unit, now 8.7, distance to shore, nearly 38 kilometers and growing, and notably water depth, average 103 meters, 30 meters for fixed and 459 meters for floating. The monthly index also summarizes pertinent segments of the global supply chain displayed in light blue and red, including CapEx and other key metrics across six segments for cabling, substructures, turbines, moorings, anchors, and installation. In its entirety, the index contains 28 key data attributes for 24 countries organized into four regions and comprises 2,520 total values. <clears throat> Ahead of delving into all of our market statistics, just a brief note of reference to explain our methodology. In the absence of valid confirmed total CapEx figures, of which there are few, we implore our proprietary QVision cost model, which is a bottom-up summation of project cost, Quest applies 18 base level cost variables to the particulars of each project to derive 15 cost subsegments, which are then parsed into our six top level CapEx segments mentioned earlier. And you see them illustrated throughout these pie charts. Again, substructure, turbine, cabling, installation, mooring, or floating only, and other, which includes project management, construction, insurance, contingency, et cetera. Please also note that any variations in these upcoming figures as compared with our Quest Offshore Wind Turbine Monthly Index would reflect current project updates as our index is published the first week of the month. QFWE has conducted primary research focused on comparisons between fixed and floating offshore wind as illustrated in this output. Note highlighted on the left, fixed units demonstrate an average CapEx per unit of 25.6 million. US dollars compared with an average CapEx per unit of 33.1 million for floating, shown on the right. And an average CapEx per megawatt of 3.3 million and 5.4 million, respectively. In short, we predict new age floating projects will be highly cost efficient. And further, we fully expect to see meaningful trends that demonstrate movement towards cost parity with six over time. This will become acutely clear once multiple contracts are placed for large size projects, each comprising between 50 and 100 units or more where serial manufacturing can and will be applied. We will highlight these economies of scale at the end when we share a sampling of our LCOE modeling with you. As shown on the left, the total addressable market in CapEx for fixed turbine units totals over $266 billion. And with respect to supply chain segmentation, the turbine spend shown in green is projected at $120 billion, a 45% share followed by substructure CapEx, the 24% share, about 65 billion, highlighted in dark blue, cabling spend of 31 billion, 12% depicted in yellow, and in red, installation CapEx totaling 24 billion, representing a 9% share of the total. For floating turbine units is shown on the right, the total addressable market in CapEx totals about $49 billion. By segment, turbine CapEx totals over $19 billion. Substructure spend 22% or $10.5 billion. Mooring CapEx in gray of $6.9 billion, 14% of the total. And cabling spend of $6.4 billion and installation spend of $1.4 billion. <clears throat> now on to our full regional analysis of the future offshore wind market by sector. 
Then combining fixed and floating projects, Europe, no surprise, is the top market, representing more than half of total megawatts, nearly 53 gigawatts, and a total addressable market in CapEx exceeding 157 billion. In fact, over the past decade, Britain's offshore wind capacity alone has grown 20-fold and now represents about 25% of their renewable generation. Moving to other regions, again representing fixed and floating in combination, Asia-Pacific totals over 28 gigawatts, a 27% share totaling 95 billion in CapEx, while North America totals 22,400 megawatts, or 20% slice, and a CapEx spend of nearly 70 billion. For bottom fixed units shown on the left, the European market represents a 53% share, 142 billion of spend, followed by Asia Pacific with 27%, and the Americas at 52 billion. As shown right for floating, Asia Pacific represents a 45% share of floating turbine unit spend, followed by the Americas with a 39% share, 19 billion, and Europe with a 16% share, 7.6 billion. Now for a closer look at fixed offshore wind activity by project in Northern Europe. This Power BI tree chart depicts fixed offshore wind activity by project size as measured in CapEx. As shown on the far left, the first two columns of colored blocks represent the largest projects in the region, which cumulatively represent about 56 billion, or 36% of the spend. Similarly, the middle two columns depict 14 projects, totaling 40 billion, or 25% of total spend. The UK continues to demonstrate its dominance of bottom fixed wind on the heels of Equinor's recent announcement to develop three large-scale offshore wind projects in the Dogger Bank region of the UK North Sea. Once online, the Dogger Bank wind farm will be the world's largest offshore wind farm development with a total install capacity of 3.6 gigawatts. This eclipses Hornsea Project 1 and 2. And this record will likely be broken once more when Orsted's Hornsea Project 3 is commissioned post-2025. Back to Dogger Bank, which will comprise three distinct projects, utilizing 10 megawatt wind turbine generators secured to monopile foundations. A game changer for Equinor's offshore wind business, the Dogger Bank auction results are testament to continued cost reductions, accelerated technology development, and reflect the vastly improved overall economics compared to the industry's early days. We'll shed direct light on this momentarily when we debut examples of our LCOE modeling efforts with you. Major players like Orsted currently dominate offshore wind, representing one third of the market outside China, and look to continue their growth trajectory in pursuit of a 2025 goal to achieve more than nine gigawatts of offshore wind capacity, which is more than double their current power. All the while established onshore wind developers such as EDF Renewables, NG, EDPR, and Iberdrola are looking to expand their opportunities offshore. As an example, over the next six years, Iberdrola is expected to grow their offshore wind capacity by a factor of eight, albeit from a small base of about 350 megawatts. As shown center, early purveyors of floating wind designs and those gaining the most traction presently include Stiesdahl Offshore Technologies' Tetraspar Demonstrator for the Shell Energy co-developed project off Carmel, Norway, and other collaborations include EDP and Repsol's investment in Principal Power's wind float design Gen 1 and 2 being deployed on demonstrator and pre-commercial floating wind projects off Scotland, the French Mediterranean, and Portugal's Atlantic. And your hill specifics about Hexacon's innovative design directly from Henrik shortly. Notably, our industry is witnessing the accelerated entrance of new players from deep water oil and gas, such as Equinor, Shell, and Total. In addition, a growing number of supply chain participants that are legacy oil and gas, active in wind include Ocker with PPI, Dor Doris Renewables, Saipam, Seaway 7, Hirama, Prismian, Nexon's Oceaneering and JDR TF Cable, to name a few. Note that list includes notable engineering firms such as KBR, Wood, 
and Gusto MSC, now an NOV subsidiary. Now a deep dive into current floating wind shown here, activity amongst these 12 designers, isolating on those projects in the under development stage, which reveals a total addressable market and CapEx in really $2 billion, comprising 51 floating turbine units, FTUs, across 15 projects, which represent $554 million in substructure CapEx, another $641 million for turbines, $290 million of export inter array cabling, and $56 million for installation activities. Asia Pacific is a definite bright spot. Shown here is floating project CapEx by developer. Quest sees the near domination of floating wind presently shining through the Asia, across the Asia Pacific, denoting 787 FTUs, floating turbine units, or nearly a 50% share of the global floating total of 1,609 FTUs and representing a total addressable market exceeding 22 billion in CapEx. According to QVision, Quest's proprietary business analytics tool, this slide reveals that Yolfi, Acacia, and Mirobini will drive 65% of the region spend, with projected CapEx of 14.5 billion representing 3.2 billion and 1.4 billion respectively for substructures and cabling, plus another 2.5 billion for moorings and 461 million plus for installation activities. Of note in the region, Sweden's Hexacon has partnered Shell in South Korea for the 200 megawatt Donghe Twin Wind Project in the Sea of Japan. Hopefully, Henrik will tell us more. Another giant leap for floating. October's Quest Offshore Wind Turbine Index will see a surge of European floating units buoyed from the UK's recently announced floating to hydrogen wind plan floating wind to hydrogen plan, which denotes an ambitious four gigawatts of floating wind in the North Sea beyond 2030. As shown, a deep dive on turbines associated with floating projects in the under, under development stage sees uh, 627 million capex for the turbine addressable market representing about 32% of total spend. The portrayal of rankings by turbine manufacturers shown in the pie reveals a leading 34% market share for Siemens Chemisa, followed closely by MHI Vestas with 30% and GE with nearly 16%. As you may have gleaned in our earlier statistics, specifically the green segmentations, the segmentation spend for turbines shown in green, now that 10 megawatts and 12 megawatt turbines are garnering deeper market penetration, as the preferred choice of developers, the percentage of total, total turbine spend is growing in relation to overall capex as their nameplate capacities are increased along with the expanded footprint of turbine blades and associated components. This slide illustrates floating offshore wind activity by project size. With a view towards the variable mix, project mix relative to project size across the globe, this Power BI tree chart illustrates floating offshore wind activity by project size as measured in CapEx. <clears throat> Excuse me. As shown on the far left, the first two columns of colored blocks represent the largest projects, which cumulatively represent about $27 billion in CapEx, or 55% of total spend. These are the ones you want to chase. Finally, uh, to wrap up uh, with our LCOE modeling. Now on to high level results uh, as illustrated from our LCOE modeling in the following scatter plot charts from Power BI for 166 and 43 floating wind projects, which demonstrate model values to allow comparisons between projects already built and those planned in the future. As shown, when comparing the levelized cost of energy between fixed and floating wind projects by online year, it's clear to see that costs are falling rapidly, both in fixed and floating. Apart from some outliers, we clearly recognize this trend. In bottom fixed projects, the red dots, Beatrice, which came online in 2018, was recorded at some 170 US dollars per megawatt hour, while the recently announced Dunkirk project 
something for like four years out, settles at 65.50, nearly $100 lower. And floating, shown in the blue dots, we see two projects highlighted in Europe and South Korea, Wind Float Atlantic in Portugal and Dong Hai Twin Wind, which both fall below the trend line at 114 and 118 dollars respectively. As a benchmark in 2019, Europe's average LCOE is $69 per megawatt hour US dollars, which is less than half the cost as compared to 2012. And finally, another illustration. When comparing the levelized cost of energy between fixed and floating wind projects by project size, shown here, you can see the steady progression towards lower costs for each, for each, in addition to the cost benefits from economies of scale over time related to larger size projects. Also shown are the relationships between pre-commercial and commercial projects as the ones we've highlighted. This chart is more fragmented than the previous chart because it shows the LSOEs uh, clearly by number of units. In fixed, we see increasing project size not necessarily resulting in lower cost. As an example, East Anglia 1 is 50% larger than East Anglia 1 North, but almost twice as expensive, at least in our model cost. Economies of scale are easier to identify in floating wind. The cost reduction between the Yolfi, pre-commercial, and Britannia, and the projected 20-unit, 12-megawatt follow-up Britannia seed project looks to see a decline well over 60% and perhaps more. We fully expect that once 100 to 200 unit projects become the norm, hopefully sooner rather than later, that their costs will come in well under $100 per megawatt hour. QVision. Finally, QVision is our robust analytics and market analysis platform available by subscription and the foundation for all the statistics we've just shown you. Please call us for more details and for a demonstration. And finally, we offer a full consulting advisory service. Thank you for your attention and interest. Thanks for that, Paul. Um, very insightful. A lot of data there, a lot of things to digest. Um, we had a lot of questions coming in right now, but like I said at the start, um, keep bringing them in, and we'll go through them all at the end. Um, and we'll we'll have you'll have obviously Eric to help you as well with that. So now we'll be moving on to Henrik. Um, Henrik, I've just requested that you share your screen if you want to jump onto that, and we can get going. Very good. <clears throat> thank you very much, Dominic. Uh, thank you for also for organising uh, uh, this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, also, uh, I'd like to uh, pay my respects to Quest for bringing metrics into the uh, uh, rapidly expanding and evolving uh, offshore wind market and floating wind market, because uh, I also have an experience from oil and gas, and that metrics is invaluable when you try to grow your business. So thank you very much for making that effort into floating wind as well. What I'd like to do, my name is Henrik Borshevsky. I'm the CEO of uh, Hexagon AB, based in Stockholm, Sweden. One of the, one of the countries that has uh, a lack of offshore wind of any significance. However, a long tradition as a shipbuilding nation many years ago, and actually the first oil production asset uh, that was floating was built in Sweden, and some of the engineering later bought by KBR, but there's an heritage for construction and design of uh, floating assets. Uh, and from that, we have brought some talent together and we try to enable <coughs> some further efficiency we, to the floating wind market. Um, uh, we are uh, not an early mover. Uh, we have been following the, the different demonstrators in operation, both in Europe and Japan and US. And uh, what we uh, are, uh, uh, what I will go through with you in a few pictures is a few slides, is the, the components, the standard components that enables to have two turbines side by side in all weather conditions. 
So first of all, um, a little bit about the concept. A floating unit, uh, what we design is the yellow and red and the mooring system. It's all based on standard turbine components and all the design criteria is set by the standard criteria from the wind turbine manufacturers. The design as such is turbine agnostic. However, there is of course a very important design phase to integrate turbine mooring and floater into one product. Uh, it's a semi-submersible platform. Uh, what that means is that you will use water ballast to bring stability uh, to the uh, uh, unit. So when we have a, a, a new a, a construction without ballast, it has a draft of approximately five meters, and then you uh, tow it to site with uh, conventional tugboats. Uh, with the, uh, both towers and turbines raised and tested in a protected environment. And then you connect to uh, pre-laid cables and mooring systems in a wind park. Uh, the uh, uh, ballast uh, draft is approximately 15 meters. So you have thousands of, of tons of water ballast uh, to be, ha have the semi-submersible to behave pretty much like an island. And, and when I was uh, a lot younger, my, my first uh, ride with a helicopter to a uh, semi-submersible floating oil drilling rig in the Gulf of Mexico, you would step out of the helicopter and think that everything would be moving like a vessel. But to, to, everyone's, to everyone's astonishment, it's lying still, even though the waves are big. And this is the benefit of having an open steel structure where the wave power of the wave just passes through the structure. Uh, the ability to weather vane with the unit is the single point mooring system where uh, all anchor lines are vertically coming out of a turret in the third corner of the triangle. And uh, uh, this is also well proven in the oil and gas industry. And uh, I will show you here uh, just a animation of the functionality as such. Uh, this is very new to the wind industry, neither onshore or bottom fixed. You can actually move the position of the turbine as such. You only have the yaw of the nacelle, but with our uh, enablers, we actually move the floater with the wind direction. And what is now the benefit? Uh, well, there are several benefits that will take me hours to uh, give you a detail about. Just email me if you want more, more than the summary I give today. But one of the main benefits could be shown here, how you can add additional turbines to a given water area. With two turbines on each platform, you have a lot more capacity available with the same wake loss. So all these uh, 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 animations are done with uh, using proven software, uh, simulating what the capacity increase can be. The water area of 25 square kilometers in the North Sea that we have a permit for, we can put 70% more capacity into that water area with uh, having less units, but two turbines of each. The key component, two components to enable this is number one, that the mooring system is a single point mooring system and there's a large turret designed where, which uh, is fixed to the mooring system and bearings allow the hull, the, the, uh, uh, bearing the two floating turbines, to actually weather vane. Just like uh, you're anchoring your motorboat or a tanker uh, offshore, it will always turn into the wind direction. The other component that is a key uh, for the 
ability to turn is the electrical swivel where the transfer of both optical cable and electricity through uh, from the turbines into the uh, then able to export it to the um, sea bottom and bring the electricity ashore the swivel as such is already in manufacturing and used in uh, other industries standard components as well without these two components we could not have a twin turbine concept here's a little bit more details about the uh, uh, drawing of the uh, of the swivel and the turret. Uh, I, I could also point out that the uh, designers that uh, uh, have experience of designing turrets in the oil and gas industry uh, view our turret as being the most simple design of any turret because it only carries the mooring system and the cable, whereas in oil and gas you have risers and uh, pipes and God knows what coming through a photonic system. Uh, the dynamic cable doesn't really uh, bring any added value from uh, a twin turbine concept. It's the same kind of dynamic cable that is used by any other floating device for wind, wind power. The main benefit is that we need one cable for two turbines and not one cable per turbine. So we have half as many cab dynamic cables in any given uh, wind park. And whether it's, uh, if you have 100 turbines, we need 50 cables instead of 100. And that is probably the most expensive part of the cabling cost uh, within uh, the floating wind park cost structure. So we save on CapEx. Fabrication. Uh, the the uh, illustration you see on the right side is the dry dock in the city of Ulsan in South Korea. It's one of the larger in the world. And the two yellow triangles is the relative size of our triangles. And to be able to serial manufacture in a protected environment, we estimate will bring the cost down per unit larger within floating wind hulls than in the bottom fixed industry and the simple reason is that whether the water depth is uh, 50 meters 100 meters or 150 meters you you actually manufacture on exactly the same drawings the whole wind park this is not the case with either monopiles or jackets so serial manufacturing is the key enabler for cost reduction and the cost reduction i estimate is going to be steeper than we have seen in the bottom fixed market over the last 10 years our first generation project had the vertical towers and columns and that was uh, all our data was design criteria was based on the north sea harsh environment uh, we still have the permit, which is about eight kilometers off the north coast of uh, KTNS in Scotland. Dunray is an old uh, decommissioned uh, nuclear power plant, and the grid is well renovated for renewable energy transportation. Uh, the mooring system in that, in, in the uh, Dunray case, uh, was specifically made for that project to be a uh, catenary mooring uh, with chains with a clump weight about 20 meters above sea bottom and a fairly large footprint but with uh, six anchors only for two turbines uh, the engineering procedure went pretty far we had all the pre-feed feed and detailed design done we both uh, uh, wind tunnel testing of a model of uh, one scale to 225 and also a 1 to 50 scale wave and, uh, and wind uh, tank testing exercise performed uh, to verify all the um, computer simulations it's about 100,000 engineering hours spent 
And with that, we have then tried to optimize the structure. And then we come to what we call the generation two, where we are actually tilting the columns and towers to reduce the size of the triangle, to, uh, which will make uh, a hull structure of less weight. Uh, also, uh, we have a, a hybrid mooring system uh, under development, which is a, uh, uh, one would say, a hybrid between a TLP. With a, we have, we have a, a tension in the, uh, in the mooring lines and a much smaller footprint on the sea bottom. And you would then uh, combine that with floating turbines on the two back corners. And this is not, uh, I think, applicable for all waters around the world, but for several, several water areas, this mooring system could be quite uh, efficient. The savings in metrics, uh, I just want to highlight in this table the platform weight. And you can see the shadow is the generation one, uh, whereas the yellow and red is the existing design that we are developing for the first wind farm in South Korea. It's a, a smaller triangle um, carrying, um, in this uh, uh, illustration, five megawatt turbines. We bring the cost, uh, sorry, the platform weight down from over 6,000 tons to just over 2,500 tons with the same weather characteristics, which is harsh environment, North Sea. Uh, the uh, uh, idea of having two turbines side by side, uh, we have done quite a lot of R&D around together with Uppsala University north of Stockholm. That is probably the number one Swedish faculty for uh, wind, wind power aerodynamics. And we have in their supercomputer made some very interesting tests bringing the turbines closer and closer to each other to try to uh, uh, see how close can they be without uh, any increase in loads or fatigue uh, or losses in production. And you can see the uh, tables on the right where, where the actual um, uh, results are fairly similar to a single standalone turbine. So uh, the, uh, the um, uh, ability to have two turbine motions side by side uh, without interference is actually uh, better than initially thought. And if we look at, there are some, uh, of course, we will be some uh, misalignment issues when waves and wind are not in sync uh, certain time periods, but it's a very, very uh, conservative numbers when in small numbers when it comes to energy loss uh, because of misalignments the uh, uh, this, this picture is just to show that we're not alone thinking about multi-turbine rotors uh, this uh, tower was published uh, december 18 from uh, vestas a test unit onshore in denmark where they're actually, they stated that there was a power gain of approximately one and a half percent due to the interaction between the rotors with a multi-rotor wind tower with four rotors. So this is still early days to see what the gains perhaps may be, but at least in our simulations, which is not in prototype like the Vestas machine here, uh, there is no energy loss anyway in our simulations. Uh, we're pretty much uh, uh, in the midst now of uh, computing uh, and uh, uh, moving forward with the, uh, with the design criteria in the wind park in South Korea. And um, uh, so far we have not uh, uh, run aground on any showstoppers. To the contrary, uh, there are, uh, uh, it's actually enabled by conventional mooring systems as well, even though the triangle is somewhat smaller. The uh, uh, 
uh, every project needs to have its own input when it comes to before design, which is of course both uh, water depth, tidal range, wave, wind, uh, soil bottom conditions and uh, supply chain infrastructure. And here I would say that probably there is no better country to uh, commercialize large scale of floating wind than in South Korea. The uh, large shipyard capacity is well beyond any other nation maybe um, at least uh, uh, that's the experience in oil and gas now maybe china would would uh, uh, claim that they are even larger in uh, shipbuilding capacity than korea but it's really been a big big uh, a benefit it will be a big benefit for cereal manufacturing in south korea for that home market the um, as I said, there are both uh, our uh, own uh, mooring system with uh, with TLP element, but the catenary mooring system, there are pros and cons of both, and uh, it'll be the project that decides which one will be the chosen one for any given wind park. Our IP is pretty much described in these two pictures where we have a uh, tilted tower and turbine or two such as a, a one unit. That patent is uh, uh, granted in Sweden and we're now in the PCT process. And the same with the uh, mooring system is not granted yet, but applied and protected. Um, we do also have an in-house software to compare single turbine wind parks with twin turbine to be able to quantify the capacity increase and the cable reduction decrease which are two main benefits of twin turbine concepts uh, that software is uh, verified by third parties um, made with uh, industry standards and we will be able to use that for any feasibility studies on the planet uh, there is uh, some uh, interesting intelligence also in the code so we, we are experimenting with maybe having a more asymmetrical wind farm layout to gain production. So with this, I'd like to thank you all for listening and uh, uh, look forward to the Q&A. Excellent. Thank you, Henrik. That was, um, that was great. Um, great to hear. Um, I'm now going to invite Eric, just with a, a little consciousness of time, because um, we want to get to the Q&A. Um, so keep questions coming in we've had loads of questions and we won't get to them all but that's not to say don't send them in because I have made a note of all of them and I'll be sending them out to Henrik and um, Paul and Eric as well after the webinar and hopefully we'll get something sent out to you next week with all the uh, slides and all the questions answered okay so um, on to Eric here we go Good day, everybody. Thank you for joining. Um, indeed, given the time uh, needed for uh, Q&A, I will try to get to, to this with, uh, with turbo speed, if you don't mind. Um, we've been looking at the presentation from, uh, from Paul. Um, uh, this, this is to show you where all that data comes from. Um, we have a QVision uh, suite of uh, data packages, uh, which is fed by a um, Rather comprehensive uh, database on projects, which per project uh, fills about 250 data points that our team is tracking on a daily basis. Uh, so you will see that any data that we uh, we show is is being uh, updated on a on a 24/7 basis. Um, the the main screen um, is um, a screen that will um, show you all the projects around the world. Um, and um, it, it shows a number of uh, filters already that where you can choose whether you will see something on a regional level or, um, or maybe drill deeper. And I will show for that the other page where all the filters are shown, um, which are uh, the project names, uh, the designers, developer names. Obviously, the main filter is whether you'd like to see uh, the fixed data or the floating data. 
Um, and here, not only on regional level, you can also drill down on national level. So you will be able to see which projects uh, are currently uh, under development in France or any other country for that matter. Um, you can also select um, on uh, segmentation and that will go throughout the, uh, the module. And um, the sorry for my email messages, but this is online. So this is actually uh, streaming data. Um, uh, the, uh, next, uh, the next page um, uh, will show you um, the um, CAPEX uh, overview based on, on, LCO, on LCOE. Um, Paul has shown this already. Um, the good thing about this is that we can slide here and, and select certain uh, values. We can uh, again go into the region, regional level. Um, and I'd like to start by clicking floating here, and that will mean that throughout this um, uh, this, this um, procedure, through, throughout all the sheets, we will see floating data only. Um, this is really a comprehensive tool. Um, what is more important, it is really fun to work with because we know all the data is there. Um, the, the, um, the purpose may may differ per per person. If you're in if you're in sales or if you're in research or an analyst, um, each of us will have a different look on data or a different need for data. And obviously, the uh, the abilities to filter and move the data around um, gives you a great insight in exactly the kind of data that you're looking for. Um, the analyst will maybe look for the um, uh, for the for the for the statistical data, I may have some streaming problem here, um, so I'll try to do this by voice. Um, the, the analyst may be looking for statistical data. Um, other uh, the, the salespeople or business development people uh, may want to look more for the um, the opportunity in the market. Um, we have a, a segmentation called to be decided, which is one of the most interesting fields in the in in the whole package because um, obviously that is where you can see what is still to be uh, to be decided for indeed um, that's where the opportunities are um, we have uh, in this sheet that Paul also showed we have a comprehensive overview of the market both on the fixed and the floating side um, we we can look at all the details per segmentation throughout uh, the software package we can look at a certain a time window um, and see what happens to the capex per, per megawatt or the, the capex per unit for that matter. Um, the sheets um, will give you all the filters that you need and all the segments that you need to know. Uh, we have a, a whole list of, uh, of filters uh, both on LCOE, uh, capex by developer, by, by segmentation. Um, uh, so, so it, won't, it would surprise me if you find anything uh, or miss anything in there. Um, the, um, the quality of the, of the data is reliable because um, our model decides for us um, uh, what the outcome is. Um, we, so we, we are sometimes surprised, surprised ourselves by the outcome of some of the analysis we do. And, um, uh, our data uh, architect David Sutherland and I, who uh, spent hours and hours on uh, trying to find uh, the, the, some of the relationships between the data, um, sometimes have great fun in trying to double the cost for a certain segment like cabling to see what happens um, to the um, to the capex or the segmentation cost. Um, and indeed, if you um, if you would experience that, you will see for yourself. Um, what the possibilities of the of the data are. Um, I think I'm going to um, try and close this so that we have time for the uh, uh, Q&A session. I thank you for your attention and I look forward to the uh, Q&A session after this. Excellent, thanks Eric. Okay, so let's just dive straight into some of these questions then. Um, so, got a question here for, I mean, I think everybody can answer these, but this one first came through for Paul. So, speaking for the US market, would it be possible for accelerated deployment of US offshore wind to impact the trajectory of construction costs 
to drop by 10% per year. Um, can you <clears throat> yep. Dominic, hey. can you hear me? Yes. Good, thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, I, I believe it wasn't cited whether it was specific to fixed or floating, so they're they're different. But uh, the near-term projects, of course, uh, um, Vineyard Wind is undergoing an, an, another federal level environmental review. Uh, so that there's some maybe politics involved, but uh, these pro we're seeing uh, progress on those projects, and you're talking is 10% a year um, total cost reductions feasible? Um, I would say they are. Uh, we can certainly run modeling on that, giving more parameters and, and specifics. Um, the floating projects uh, for the Pacific are a little bit further out, but they're starting to gain traction relative to the state of California's environmental goals, including carbon-free goals uh, moving as early as 2045. Um, <clears throat> uh, but the, those projects, uh, the ones we're looking at, I believe Eric can uh, speak more specifically, uh, are at least uh, 50 units or more each. Uh, they're half of uh, 500 megawatts or a gigawatt or more type projects that are uh, four or five projects that are being uh, in the plan stage. So those would um, absolutely be serial manufacturing. Okay, great. So, um, so we have another question. Um, uh, the total floating wing market projections, 49 billion US dollars, 12 gigawatts by 2031, um, represents projects that have reached FID or is that in development? That's, uh, thank you for the question. Um, it's the, the full universe of projects that are, are not uh, online. So it would start with those projects currently under development uh, for installation this year or beyond, um, installation and uh, commissioning. And uh, we have another uh, planned status and a possible status. The possibles are not, um, there's some uh, variation between the statuses and uh, we have an FID data attribute, um, but most of the possible projects do not have FID. Okay, got a question here for um, Henrik. Um, how advanced is the swivel connection for the electrical cable as the floater is turning around a single floating uh, single point? Um, the um, um, I would say that the, the design will be finalized uh, during 2020, but it's all based on uh, well-proven standard components when it comes to the electrical swivel. And the dynamic cable um, also is fairly new to the uh, oil and, to the wind industry, but well, there's a lot many years experience of uh, dynamic cables in the oil and gas industry. Okay, what what is the um, Henrik again? What is the level of redundancy on the single point mooring in relation to cables and in relation to load bearing? <laughs> Um, that's a good question. Uh, depends on where on on where you are, but you have, you know, in the um, in the dimensioning of the mooring system is of course a very critical part of the whole design work, and uh, that can only be uh, frozen once you decide on the turbine size. And in the Korean case, of course, it's a fairly moderate weather conditions compared to the North Sea. However, there's a uh, typhoon uh, element, so you have much uh, more severe loads rather than fatigue issues. And uh, uh, those can be accommodated, of course. There are other moored, moored floating assets in the Asian Pacific than uh, floating wind parks, but uh, the mooring systems uh, uh, have to be rigid enough and have the redundancy accounted for. And it's, here we are working very closely with the classification societies. Excellent. So can the, can the um, just thinking about O&M here, is, can the platform yaw be locked to allow access? 
the 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 turbine uh, depends on the size of the project. I would say there are you could do a sort of um, deviations from the standard uh, turbines if you have a large enough commercial order for the turbine vendor. So it's pretty much a part of the interaction between the turbine manufacturer and the uh, floating in the design team. Yes, uh, you can uh, uh, lock the yaw. Um, and we do actually restrict the yaw in the, with, the, with the tilted towers. You cannot yaw 360 degrees, you can only yaw outwards. Um, question for, for Quest, guys. Um, where do you collect the uh, the CapEx data? Uh, someone's questioning the uh, project specific and, and surely they're therefore confidential. Um, this is Eric. Um, we, we have a, a wealth of sources, but generally what we do is find um, the, um, the, the most, let's say, public data um, in, in screening the sources, both online and in person. We talk to uh, developers and designers. Um, obviously, the CAPEX is uh, not something that is uh, being easily shared. Um, so what we do normally is, is run our cost model, come to a certain conclusion about CAPEX and then verify, try to verify um, with the developer or the designer. Um, and and um, then they are normally generally prepared to indicate um, where we are. And we know the system works because we're running our own verification methods where we see that uh, we are... are, are um, accuracy is well within uh, small margins. Um, so, Eric, is, is the uh, is the data more likely to overestimate or underestimate the market size? Um, is that is the same? Is this the same for fixed and for floating? I'm sorry, I missed the first part of the question. So is, it, is the data and, um, likely to overestimate or underestimate the market size? Typically what you see is that, especially longer out, um, new projects are being announced. Um, other projects disappear. Um, in the beginning, let's say four or five years ago, uh, there were a lot of uh, speculative uh, projects announced. Uh, most of which have, or a good chunk of them, have, have disappeared. Um, we learn by our own uh, verification methodology uh, how reliable a certain um, developer obviously is uh, by, by, by statistics, but also um, we, we have about 16 criteria by which we measure um, a project so that when the project goes forward, uh, let's say that one of the milestones, a big milestone is, for example, is there a PPA, is there an FID, is there uh, a consent? That is the easy part. Much earlier on, uh, it's a lot more difficult and we, we, we verify uh, or have a project qualify on uh, the quality of the technology, uh, the financial stability of a company involved uh, and so on. So it's a, it's, like it, like I said, it's 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 about sixteen criteria that that make the puzzle complete. Uh, thanks, Eric. <clears throat> this is Paul. Excuse me. Just one one uh, one comment to that. Um, long term, it's underestimated because it's not a, a full forecast. This is a bottoms up approach to identified and and known or announced uh, or to be announced projects. So um, long, long term, it's not a, we're not looking at, you know, um, creating projects that aren't there. Uh, we do that in kind of on the consulting side. But uh, because this is a bottoms up, uh, we have tangible pieces of information on that they're will or they're looking at developing uh, either from a designer side or from the developer side. Uh, this is the early stages in the cases of the possible projects, early stages of um, putting together uh, plans for a project. Okay, so um, just to jump back to uh, Hexkin and to Henrik, um, we have a question here of what turbine supplier would you plan to use and what has the OEM feedback been in regards to tilted towers? 
Um, the uh, uh, turbine supplier will be announced when it's uh, all finalized and agreed to announce it, but it will be a well-known standard turbines. Uh, this uh, project uh, in uh, South Korea is a uh, uh, an effort to uh, what should I say? Uh, fairly, um, you know, catch up uh, with going for a large commercial wind farm uh, straight away. And uh, we don't uh, need to experiment on turbines. We will focus very much on the behavior of the foundation and optimizing uh, to, for for low C, low LCOE on the wind farm operation, construction operation. Also, it's worthwhile to maybe mention to uh, Eric's point on the uh, market signals. The, uh, the uh, two years ago, I think that uh, uh, the uh, uh, sizing of market potential in Korea was uh, quite different than today. The, the, the actual political decision last year to uh, have a uh, feed-in tariff or a, a re uh, electricity remuneration that increases the further offshore you are unique and that decision was made last summer in Korea and it only took about six months for five inter four or five international developers to uh, establish uh, a relation with the city of Ulsan and uh, um, from that the water is sold out there's no more room for any additional developers in that area so it just tells you how quickly this industry can grow if we have the right decisions made and there could be countries out there that we don't know about today that will come with a decision and within months there's going to be strong competition about gaining water acreage and uh, grid access for um, having a profitable uh, wind farm operation. Okay, I believe we've just about run out of time. Um, so in the interest of not getting cut off by the software, if we already haven't, um, we will be able to answer all your questions. I'll be sending the questions out to um, to our panelists and we'll try and get these wrapped up to you. I will deliver them with the presentations and the full recording sometime sort of early next week. Um, obviously, we're going to give the guys a couple um, of days to answer these questions. There's been a lot um, of interest in this webinar. So lastly, I'd just like to thank um, our three panelists, Paul, Henrik and Eric. Um, fantastic presentations, fantastic Q&A. Um, I'd like to remind everyone uh, that this was produced in conjunction with the Offshore and Floating Wind Europe 2019 conference, which is being held in London. If you're interested in floating, if you're interested in the future developments, um, then that is definitely a conference that I would recommend checking out. Um, so without any more to say, um, Thanks to the panelists and uh, thanks. Thank you very much, Dominic. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Dominic. Thanks, everybody.